Welcome to today's Software AG webcast titled, Connect Your Mainframe to API Ecosystems. Today's webcast will be presented by Bob Jeffcott, Principal Systems Engineer at Software AG. As we move through today's presentation, we invite you to submit any questions that you may have via the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom center of your webcast dashboard. We will address your questions at the end of today's program. In the event that we're not able to answer your question, your submission will be noted, and today's presenter will be back in touch with you as soon as possible. Today's presentation is also being recorded. This program recording will be made available to you in an email that will be sent to you within approximately 24 hours. It is now my pleasure to welcome Bob Jeffcott. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, I hope everyone is healthy and safe. This is the fourth in a series of mainframe integration webinars. We're talking about connecting your mainframe to the API ecosystems that are out there. Uh, in previous webinars, we had talked about how to do that. And today we're going to show you how to leverage those connections uh, to participate in an API ecosystem. Um, one of the things that is essential is today's mainframe. Um, a majority of executives recognize the mainframe as a platform for growth. It still produces 68% of the world's production uh, yet at a fraction of the cost. Um, you are seeing how critical it is today. Um, you are hearing some news about some of the challenges that some mainframes and older systems are facing these days. Um, but again, your mainframe runs business and mission critical core applications with very, very valuable data in those mainframes. Um, it is the differentiating business logic uh, that allows you to excel for your organization. But the reality is there are more and more digital use cases, whether in the commercial area of self-serve or in the government areas with that same self-serve, trying to do more with less. And the way you can leverage all those mission critical applications in the mainframe is through APIs and API management. And we're gonna look at those today. Um, it used to be that the mainframe was the center of the universe. Everything ran on the mainframe. But then that technology universe expanded. Um, first with custom applications with .NET, or even back in the day, VB.NET, uh, and Java and Oracle. Then came along the ERP packages, the SAPs, the people softs of the world. Then the cloud emerged. So pieces were being taken off in favor of cloud-based applications, uh, Salesforce, Workday, et cetera. Um, and now you're seeing more and more cloud-based services, whether it be something like blockchain, whether it be uh, all the myriad of cloud services that are available. Um, slowly those services were moved off of the mainframe, those capabilities. Um, however, the mainframe is still an integral part of those and can participate uh, with all those other applications very easily. Um, just a reminder, um, with Software AG, we have the Web Methods mainframe integration. Uh, our idea is to leverage the existing mainframe functions as reusable services. In previous webinars, we talked about how you could do that at the session level through screens. We talked about how you could connect easily uh, at the code level uh, leveraging the COBOL assembler, PL1 natural business logic that's out there, um, or directly at the data level, whether it be vSAM, QSAM, DB2, database, and how you can leverage those in your digital use cases to do newer, quicker mobile applications, web and portal, cloud integration, internet of things. Um, so now that we have all of these services, Let's talk about the benefits of that. So now I can participate in an integration layer between the mainframe and software as a service or other data sources or other packages uh, or, or even B2B partners. It's the foundation of your API. It allows you to be agile 
one of the complaints that we hear is everything takes so long on the mainframe. If I have to make a change uh, to the program, it takes time. It takes resources. As New Jersey was discovering, um, those resources are not always available. By service enabling that, you expose those out and allow a a variety of different developers access to that information, those capabilities. Um, it allows you to quickly and easily adapt your uh, requirements and, and change services as you need. Um, and let's look at some of those common integration scenarios that we're talking about leveraging those services. Um, the first thing that we see is the need to take mainframe capabilities and adapt them, put them together, make changes. Uh, and again, we don't have those resources. We don't have the, the COBOL programmers and the volumes that we may need. So the idea is to create those services and put those services together to create new capabilities or to change the capabilities, change the processing logic without having to touch the underlying code. Um, similarly, as functions get pulled off of the mainframe, um, the need to integrate between other applications and the mainframe. So maybe I have a new CRM system. It might be in the cloud. It might be an on-prem, but I need to communicate between that system and the order entry or the inventory systems that may be on my mainframe. And more and more we're seeing in syncing information between the mainframe and other applications. So it's real-time updates. Doesn't necessarily involve a web app, doesn't necessarily involve a, a smartphone application, but just the need to keep systems in sync. Um, one of the use cases that we see for this is actually um, where you might be slowly migrating things off of the mainframe. There's a need to keep things in sync together. Um, and I think my favorite example, um, and these are by no means all of them, it's just some common ones that we see out here, um, but is actually leveraging external APIs from the mainframe. Um, there are two great examples that, um, that we see out there. Uh, one was uh, Dole Foods. Dole Foods was approached by two of their largest customers, Walmart, and um, a food uh, chain that escapes me in Europe. And they said, you need to be participating in blockchain. The problem with it was when there were food recalls, um, it was taking weeks to track down that. Um, they said that we want you to leverage IBM's blockchain um, platform. And if they could do that, it would reduce the tracking time from weeks down to minutes. Um, so their mainframe application, which ran all of the, that capability, all of the food tracking, all of the delivery, all of that information, um, they made a single change to make a call from that application out to IBM's blockchain. Uh, IBM called it the fastest um, implementation of blockchain that they'd ever seen. It was by doing one single API call from the mainframe. Um, another uh, example in the government side was that um, there was a state agency um, that offered up a web service that said, is this person currently um, a guest of the state? Are they in state or county prisons? A very enterprising mainframe programmer said, hey, I can use that put that into um, one of their batch mainframe applications. Um, and that application was unemployment claims processing. They saved over $100 million uh, in bogus claims um, by validating whether that person was in uh, prison and no longer eligible for unemployment claims. So again, two simple integrations out of the mainframe to leverage things that were out there in the world and had huge impacts on their organizations. Um, with that, I would actually like to jump into a live demo of orchestrating the services that are on the mainframe and showing you a couple of these uh, integrations and we're actually going to do the first three. We are going to orchestrate um, 
services within the mainframe to produce a new capability. We are going to orchestrate uh, mainframe and external services to do that same uh, service. And then we're going to show you real-time integration between uh, Salesforce and a, a mainframe application. That, excuse me, I am going to bounce over to our um, Software AG Designer. It is our web methods IDE that allows us to develop services and orchestrate those services and publish those services out. Um, in previous um, webinars, we had created services that leveraged COBOL code that was to return um, employee information. We leveraged data that was pulling vSAM information from orders. And we leverage session level, screen level um, to get customer information. So I do just want to show you those three very quickly. So we have a get customer. We walk through your mainframe screens, recording, uh, pushing information into the mainframe, and then grabbing the information back out. And while today's example is just gathering information, this can be um, bi-directional and it can be the whole crud. You can create records, you can read records, update records, and delete records. So while today we're just showing you gathering the information. So I'm gonna do this run as a service. So what this is going to do is this is going to go out to the mainframe in real time. It's going to look for a particular customer ID and you'll see in my work area that I will be returning that information down here. So this customer ID returns Charles Chappelle, uh, some peripheral other information as well. Um, then I want to go here and let's do a order by customer. So in this particular order by customer, what we're doing is it's going to be a connection to a vSAM file that is orders. I'm going to select all the information that's in that vSAM file where a customer ID equals my input, and I'm gonna return that information. So my input there is cust ID, and my output is going to be all of the orders. So let's just run that very quickly. And again, we'll use that same user ID. The IDE, when I'm doing testing, actually retains the information that I put to it. So down here, you can see we return all the orders for this customer. It appears that there are six orders, zero through five. Uh, and then lastly, I'm gonna just show you the employee detail that actually goes out to a COBOL program through an RPC server um, that is defined through a CICS socket listener. The input is the employee ID, the output is the employee ID and their details here. So let's go ahead and run that one. And again, for any of these, so I'm going to return that data. Helga Schmidt is going to be the person I'm returning. Um, so now I have those three services. They were done very quickly and easily uh, built in the last webinars live. Um, but now I want to orchestrate it. So I have someone approaches me and says, you know what, I need a new service that gathers maybe for a customer help desk or for customer self-serve. I want to see the customer. I want to see the employee that is assisting that customer. And I want to see their current orders. So with that, I'm going to go create a document from scratch. Let's say new document. That document is going to be all cust info. Now with that, I'm going to create, give it a name. Cust info, because I can't type well. Um, and now I'm going to do a little bit of cheating for cutting and pasting. So for the services that we have, if you notice, the output of this was rather extensive. But for this particular service, I don't care. I don't need all of this information. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create two little strings. 
it's going to be first name. It's going to be last name. And I'm going to say that that's part of my customer. Now, this is where I am going to cheat. Um, I have this customer order information. So I'm going to copy this because I do want all that information. So I'm going to do a simple paste here. It's going to be order info. Um, if you see here, it's a recurring repeating field. So that means that there may be a multiple return grouping of information. So I, with that, I'm going to see the order ID, the customer ID, the product ID, the order date, and the quantity. So I'll see all that information because that's what I want to return for my help desk or maybe my self-serve portal. Um, and last, I want to see another um, account rep. For this, let's put him under that as well. And I want to see the account rep's first name. And I want to see the account rep's last name. And again, I want to put that under that heading of those two. So now I have a document that describes what a new service that's been requested. Now, if I was just a mainframe programmer, I'd say, well, I'm going to have to write a new COBOL program, a new natural, a new PL1 program that's going to go get that information or maybe call those COBOL programs that already exist. But in this particular case, the customer program, we lost the source code for it. So I wouldn't even begin to know how to do that. Um, I do need to move him over so the account rep is part of this. So I've created this new requirements document and now I'm actually going to create a new flow service. This is how Software AG's web methods integration platform uh, leverages um, uh, all the additional, it, it orchestrates all the services. So let's save this and I am going to come in here and I want to create a new flow service. So this is going to orchestrate and I'm going to call it get cus info. And I'm just going to leave it blank. Now the actual um, language of flow actually just has some drag and drop services. I can map, I can do branches based upon a value or a condition. I can loop through information. I can do repeat. Um, I can order things in sequence. I can do try catch and I can finally do uh, try finally and then exit. So very basic things, but the power is leveraging services that are already out there. So what we're going to do first is we're going to define an input. So my brand new service is going to take cust ID as a input. My output, I'm gonna take that new all cust info I created. The nice part is even though that's my document, I can call it whatever I want. So I'm gonna call it cust data, just to be clear. If you notice, it has all this information. Now the nice part is since I'm using a reference document, if I change the document here, it automatically changes it here. So if requirements change over time, I can make that change over time. Um, with that, I'm gonna go look at my tree layout for this particular thing. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna get the customer information. So I'm going to invoke that service that says um, get my customer information. So I'm going to go leverage that screen-based session. And what I'm going to do is do a simple mapping from my input to that selected customer ID. Now, um, my output for this service was all of that information. But again, I don't really want to see all that information. I just want to see their first name. So I'm going to drag that over here and I am going to see their last name and drag that over there. Do a simple save, and I've now mapped that information. But now the next thing I wanna do is see all the customer's orders. So I'm gonna drag that next step up there, which is that 
calling my vSAM listener and getting that information. So I'm going to use that same input because my input for this was customer ID. So I'm going to do that. If you notice here, there's some credential overrides. There's some connection overrides that you can do. Um, so if you're doing this uh, where you have to pass a separate user ID password, you can do that. Or if you're doing it from test to dev to prod, you can do that as well. Now, my output here was results. Now, the nice part is because this results maps back to what I built for my screen here with order info, I can simply do results to order info. And it's going to map because all those fields map the same. Um, it will automatically map that for me. So now I've got, gathered from a session level integration, my customer information from a data level integration. I've got my vSAM data. Um, that I built using SQL. And last, I want to get my employee information. Um, so who that customer rep is. Um, from that, and I have to, now one of the nice parts is it keeps my data, all that data that I've had, even though I'm not mapping it to my output, it keeps it here. So what I'm gonna do is do cheating because I do need an employee ID and I do know that person type is actually equal to that person's um, that person's uh, employee ID because I didn't have the ability to to change the vSAM file. So I do apologize for that. So I am going to do a little bit of cheating here. I'm going to go person type up to employee. So that's going to pass a one because that's a valid employee ID. And again for the output. So what I'm going to put back here is to my record, to my record, customer data, my account rep, first name, first name, and then surname to last name. And again, the nice part is my mainframe information is a little bit sometimes cryptic because I'm limited to number of characters, but because I'm now exposing this out, I can call it whatever makes sense. So I have account rep, first name, last name. So I'm going to save that um, now. And I will, I could clean all this stuff up by dropping this and you would no longer see the extra stuff. But what we're really going to care about is going to be that cus data um, because that is my output. So now if I've done this correctly, um, I should be able to come here and say run and run it as a flow service. And I am going to create, oops, I can't type. Create this, say okay. And what that did, let's hide all the peripheral stuff because this is just my little output box. But here's the information, the CUS data. Um, uh, let's just roll through it. So first name, Charles Chappelle, all the order information for Berg, which is his uh, customer number. And finally, Roland Vogel was the account rep. So that quickly, that easily, I created a service. And now I can take and say, I would like to publish this out as a web service and call it get cust info web service. So now that's available as a SOAP service. I could do the same thing as a REST service um, and then uh, register that into an API provider. So that quickly and that easily, but after you've done all that work and imagine if um, it was being done in COBOL, they say to you, hey, wait, you know what? We are actually going to um, get a new system that is going to take our, we're gonna get a new HR system. So employees no longer gonna be on the mainframe. It is going to be um, on a SQL server box. So what we can do is we can create, and I'll just create one from scratch. So a new adapter service, and we'll call it get SQL EMP. Um, and the nice part about this is we use the concept of adapters, just like we did for the mainframe with COBOL, with session level, with data level. Um, we do the same thing for, um, for open systems, whether it be an application, whether it be cloud. And we'll take a look at the cloud one here in a sec. Um, so I'm going to do a quick next. 
I want to use a SQL Server connection. Um, I don't want to write my own because I'm bad, so I'm going to do a simple select. And it's going to create a brand new service for me, asking me which table would I like to get. I'm going to use the Northwind employees. Um, it's going to ask me which fields I would like to select. I'm going to say I will select them all, employee ID, as well as all the rest. And I apologize, my server is sitting in Germany. I'm going through a VPI connect, VPN connection, um, and it's taking a little bit of time sometimes, with, especially with the drain that we're having on the um, internet these days with everyone working from home. And I want to say where employee ID equals something. So I have this new service that I generated that's now going against SQL. And if I run that guy, uh, get SQL imp, run him and test him out, I'm going to say employee ID one, and I get an employee ID one, Nancy Devalio. Obviously the systems aren't in sync quite yet because uh, it is a new system. But what I'm gonna do is let's go back to this get cust info that was going and doing a mainframe. I'm gonna make a copy of him just so I can leave that one out there and let's paste him. There we go, so we have get cust one. Um, so what I do is I'm gonna take out that employee detail. I'm now gonna drag in this get SQL employee Go back to our pipeline here. So now I am on a new step. Uh, it's expecting an employee ID update. And again, I'm gonna steal that same uh, person information to use that as the employee ID. But my mapping out now is going to be uh, to CUS data, uh, to the agent information it is going to be last name, and first name. And I'm going to save that and I'm going to run that guy. And because it is a brand new service, it didn't save that, but I'm going to still go with the Bergs. Whoa! I'm not sure why that blew up. why you don't test these live. Let's do a different one. Get SQL. Oh, because I was trying to mismatch the strings. Never mind, that wasn't that. All right, so I will do a little bit of cheating here. I'm going to put that back in. We'll, instead of mapping, because I was trying to map a string to uh, an integer, I'm actually just going to cheat really quickly and fill in that value. Um, but again, let's map that guy out. The results are going to map last name to last name, first name to first name. Save that. So I apologize for a little cheating. The systems didn't match and I don't want to take the time to do a translation from an alpha to a numeric. Um, but we will run this here as soon as my VPN connection lets me talk to Germany and back. And then we'll do one more uh, example and then we will give you back your day. At least talk. Okay, so let's not blow up this. So this time I didn't blow up. Let's hide the outrec, but cuss data. So now what I've done is I pulled that new information from that new system that quickly and easily. So that gives you the ability to update and adapt. We're gonna go through one more demo here. Um, if you remember from our PowerPoint, we talked about syncing information. So one of the things that we have here is we have the ability to do a cloud streams uh, is our, our cloud-based connector. So we're connecting to Salesforce CRM. Um, and what we do is we're using the Salesforce adapter and we have a listener 
that is listening for contact changes. So something on our integration server is listening to, um, to Salesforce's API. And if we come here and look to this listener contacts, what we're gonna do is that listener contact says, listen for change events and listen specifically for changes in the object on the Salesforce side contact. And what we do when we get those is we wanna invoke this service called log contact. So if we come over to our um, service for log contact, what that is going to do is that is actually going to execute a mainframe uh, natural program that will update a um, will update um, the employee's file. And so I'm going to bounce over here really quickly. I probably have timed out, but just so this is a list of employees. So you see we start with 1009876 and it's Mark Jones. Um, so what I'm going to do is come over to my Salesforce. Um, and I've set up a change data capture that says identify changes uh, to anything in a contact entity. Um, so I'm going to bounce back over here and I'm going to add a new contact and I am going to call it Bob Smith. And again, um, this is a demo uh, Salesforce, so I was not allowed to add my own personal fields. So I don't have an employee ID. So what I am doing though, is I am mapping if, uh, the title to uh, an employee ID. So zero, I'm going to do a save. And if I bounce back here and I have not timed out, I now have that exact same change that was done in Salesforce is now uh, reflected back on my mainframe. So that's a way to do the integration between your mainframe and other systems, whether they be cloud-based, whether they be uh, on-prem-based. Um, with that, I do wanna talk about one more thing um, and then we can get to Q&A. So we did talk about these different integrations, but now that I have these wonderful APIs, you build it and they will come. So we're starting to see, you know, that the mainframes are being stressed, that the mainframes are, are being challenged when you do have these APIs. So we want to talk a little bit about some governance considerations. Um, first and foremost is security. Um, who can get into these APIs? What authentication? Different uh, audiences may have different uh, authentication requirements. Um, are my SLAs being met? Are my results being timely? Um, what policies are we enforcing? Um, you know, what types of security, what types of um, information can I see? How often can I access something? Um, what logging can I do? Not only do I, can I say what, who can see what, but what did they actually see? Um, I know with a lot of our CGIS type implementations or criminal justice, they can go back years and say, tell me everyone that looked at this particular case and what information they saw. Um, you have throttling considerations of, you know, people are getting hit, um, you know, from external sources, whether it be for data mining, whether it be from denial of service attacks. So you want to be able to do that throttling. Um, mainframe, um, when you open up those resources, sometimes those resources are getting hit, even though they're fairly static. So you may want to consider data caching. Um, and then just API considerations, virtualization, hiding that back end uh, endpoint, versioning. If I expose something out and I want to change it, people may want to see still be able to use the old version because they're not uh, able to adapt to the new version. Um, also, it may just be a case of analytics. Um, who's using what? What services aren't being used? What are being hit the most? What are throwing the errors? What do I do when there's an error? 
Um, so those are all types of considerations so that when you um, build these APIs, you want to have uh, an API management. Ours is the API gateway. What that does is that allows you from a uh, web-based application to manage your a APIs, to see what's out there, um, to authorize uh, and make available, to do policy enforcements that we talked about, both inbound and outbound. Um, you know, those services may return something that you don't want in a not so user friendly uh, format, so we can change those. And again, that ability to do uh, API analytics to see what who's doing what. Um, and with that, if you want to see or learn more, you can simply go to www.mainframeconnect.com and learn more. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Will for questions and answers. Bob, thanks. Um, early in the program, you had made a mention about doing uh, earlier webcasts. And so a question came in uh, that said, was there a previous presentation that created the services EMP, DETL, et cetera? Yes, there was. It was the uh, COBOL enable or API enabling your COBOL application. One of the things we're, that Will mentioned uh, in the top of the presentation is that you will be getting an email uh, with the link to the recording. You will also in that email get a link to all of the previous recordings. So there was a recording on API enabling your COBOL. There was a recording on API enabling your session level data when you don't necessarily have the resources to uh, access the, the, the COBOL code or it's missing or it's just too complicated because it might cross several different COBOL screens or um, that. And then there was a data level integration. So all of those previous ones will be included in the uh, link that you will get within 24 hours. Okay, very good. The next question I have for you. How does this apply if our long-term goal is to get off the mainframe? Sure, great question. Um, so, you know, we have heard, all heard the horror stories of those rip and replaces, uh, you know, where it's a big bang uh, and there are, you know, nine figure failures. What this allows you to do is to build services that are on the mainframe and then slowly replace those services. Uh, we had a customer, uh, a state customer that did that uh, in the Southeast. They actually had two different um, applications. One, they did the service enablement, and then they slowly replaced that backend mainframe with SQL Server.net. The other application was a big bang. The one done with the service enablement and slowly replaced was on time, on budget. The other one went through multiple SIs and went through nine figures worth of uh, dollars before they actually finished it about 10 years late. Um, the other thing that we looked at was um, that real-time integration between an external system and the mainframe. And that allows you to chunk off the pieces of your mainframe without disrupting it, the overall application. So those are two different approaches that people have taken to slowly, safely, securely get off of the mainframe. Okay, the next question. What if one client needs a REST API and another needs a SOAP? API. Sure. Um, and I just kind of glossed over that. Um, but that's the, the beauty of having those services as independent agnostic services. I can put them together into that flow service and then say publish it as both a SOAP and a REST. Um, or as things change, you know, whatever the next uh, thing is, you can still retain all that work and just simply publish those out as different services um, you, without doing a lot of rework, you know, because there's always going to be the next thing. Um, you know, everyone thought SOAP was the final bestest thing in the world, then REST came along, and then REST full, and it was originally XML and now JSON. And so, yeah, the, that's the idea is that you publish out that endpoint service without uh, affecting the, the back-end agnostic services. 
Next question for you. What would be the impact of changing one of the applications like from on-prem to cloud? Um, again, we kind of did an example of that where I had the COBOL um, VCM based uh, employee system. And while I did that connecting it to a SQL server, that SQL server was actually in the cloud. Um, so again, that's the beauty of having those agnostic services um, and having the adapters that we have. You have an adapter that goes to SAP, an adapter that goes to Salesforce. Um, it's just a matter of changing that, but again, plugging that into your API ecosystem without a lot of impact. Okay, um, this last question, I don't know if it's going to be too long, so you might want to take it offline. Uh, that's your discretion, of course. It is as follows. I want to know about trading networks. I've come to know it's a predefined service. Sure, and it is a little bit long, um, but in a short, brief thing, um, trading networks gives you the ability to manage transactions from your business partners uh, in a standard EDI format, and as well as a variety of different EDI formats, HL7, Rosetta, Net, all those. So it allows you to communicate seamlessly without having to map all that information and understand that. Much like with the Salesforce, I have to admit, Salesforce to me is sometimes bewildering. So having the adapters like a trading network that allows you to do the B2B things, allows you to map that data without really having to understand that underlying um, business architecture of a HL7, of a Rosetta Net, um, and gives you those drag and drop capabilities just like we did with Salesforce. So, and I, I'll be happy to send more information about trading networks to that person when, um, when we send out the email. Great. Okay. Uh, to everybody that has been with us today, we are grateful that you're with us. and Thanks for taking the time from your day to join us. Uh, we do want you to know that we are planning a full year of webcasts that's supporting both our federal and our state and local markets. So to stay up to date on those planned programs, we invite you to visit the events page under the company tab at softwareag.com. Bob, thank you very much for your time and for a very insightful presentation today. Our program has now ended. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Will.